It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul's back from Spain. I'm back from South America. We're going to do the entire show in Spanish. No, we're not. We'll talk about Service Pack 1. A good one and a bad one and a whole lot more. Coming up next with Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode 197, recorded February 25th, 2011. Angry Bricks. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at freshbooks.com. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For 10% off your new domain, go to windows.hover.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers uh, Microsoft in all its glory. Here he is, the king of the hill, the man in charge, the guy behind the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com, the news editor for Windows IT Pro, and oh, here we go. the author of this fabulous book, the Delphi 3 Super Bible, ladies and What's gentlemen. That? What is that? What's that red mark on there? Did you get this at a flea market or something? What? It was the price sticker. I see. Actually, this was uh, this was gifted to me. It was sent to me from uh, <laughs> Joyce Maz. Joyce Mazzaroli does books and collectibles in oh, uh, in South China, Maine. Mm. Uh, her address is j o y c e m a z dot com and. I got a big package when I came back from South America. I got I got so excited, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is. You know, this was originally fifty five dollars in the U S., seventy eight dollars yeah. in Canada. The Delphi Three Super Bible. <laughs> but I'm a little. You know, um, and guess what? The fifty five dollar figure is interesting because I think that's how much I made. <laughs> guess what? <laughs> CD intact. I wonder. I wonder what's on there. <laughs> don't you know? <laughs> I don't remember. Well, it's I remember got your the name first, right on the uh, front here. I don't, I don't understand what the confusion we is. Had, we had various joke Delphi applications we had written. But I don't think that are on there. There was a visual, what do we call it? Um, not visual defrag. It was like vi visual F disk. <laughs> you know, would you like to uh, completely erase your C drive? No. You, know, you click, you click no, and then it would say now formatting. Too speed. late. <laughs> You know, or the type of joke program where you know you're supposed to click a button on the screen as you, as the mouse moves toward it, right, it moves away that. from you. you know, so you can write that crap in Delphi too, huh? Of course, of course you can. Of course you can. Delphi is a full a Turing complete. Let, let me tell you something about Delphi, and the the underlying language is Object Pascal, which, right. to, to my knowledge today, is still the purest object oriented language ever created. It's beautiful, but the the class library that this book documents was created by the guy who went on to create the .NET framework for Microsoft. Damn. So the, the descendant of this is, in fact, the .NET framework, is .NET. So, uh, you know, he also created the C, or helped create the C-sharp programming language. And, you know, in many ways, the, Delphi, or the, Delphi uh, as the, the you know, the uh, environment, or Object Pascal as a language, or uh, the VCL as it was called, the Visual Component Library, was a response to Microsoft's, at the time, awful C++ MFC libraries. Ew. And it was sort of a, a uh, here's a cleaner, nicer way of doing that kind of stuff. And then Microsoft basically bought the guy, and they made their own version called .NET. So all this .NET stuff that's happened over the past, I don't know, 12 years, is a direct descendant of that stuff. So, you know, humble beginnings, but that, the, those are really the beginnings. Want to know where T Common Dialog came from? See page 487. <laughs> want to know? Awesome. Want to know about T Dataset and its descendants? See page 593. Yes, everything you've always wondered about life is here in the Delphi 3 Super Bible. Let's Look just for it say today. those were simpler times. <laughs>
Really I just, bad. Joyce, I just want to thank you so much for sending me this book. And, uh, and, and we've been using it to hold the door open, and it's just done a damn fine job. <laughs> just, I'm just happy someone got some use out of it. <laughs> No, I'm, <laughs> you know? I'm keeping this baby. This is good. <laughs> so for those of us who, for those of you who don't listen to the show on a regular basis, this is Paul's first book, right? No, 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 no. Oh, not even your first book? No. Well, I mean, I'm going to have to go search for more? You'll never find my what first What was your book. first could, book? It was probably, I think it was an, ex, you know, Visual Basic 3. It was an oh, okay. educational title. Okay. Maybe Excel well, 90. Was that Gannett? Who did you do oh. that for? No, this Wait. is for Addison Wesley. It was Addison Benjamin Wesley. Cummings. It was their oh, yeah. educational print, uh, yeah. or educational uh, division. I'm not sure awesome. that's the right term. But. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, Paul, it's been a long time. First of all, let me thank Tom, uh, Tom Merritt for filling in for me uh, while yep. I was gone on yep. vacation. Um, yeah, it was great. Anything happen? While you were gone? <laughs> well, I know one thing that happened, because I, yes. you know, it's funny, because... You know, most tech news, you don't, you're, you know, here I am in South America on a ship with very lim limited internet Leo, access. Leo, I went away for a week and half the Middle East has fallen. Yeah, I, you know. this much I knew. I mean, the big stories yeah. you know, the little stuff you don't know. But there was one tech story that I could hear the cries of pain all the way down in Patagonia. That was okay. that Windows Phone 7 update. Yes. Something went wrong there. In fact, I have a Samsung Focus. I'm glad I wasn't, I wasn't here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. that could have been one of the problem devices. Although could have been. I'm hearing now, supposedly, you, you should be able to recover any of these phones, apparently. Oh, okay. There so, was a fear. So what happened? While. Yeah, I, don't, I can't explain what happened exactly, <laughs> but... <laughs> I can't I can explain do it, says the, Paul. I can't well, who explain can, it. Who can say what when really I happened? Because you know. when I left a month ago, you were just depressed about the update. It hadn't yeah. come out yet. But this isn't the update. So this, is, this is the funny thing. This isn't the update. This what the isn't hell is that this? Update. This this update that you're talking about is a new little update that they had to kind of push out at the last second because what they discovered was that if they there was a there was a bug in the updating mechanism on some of the phones it was a device issue so they first they had to ship this little update before they could deliver that real first update so I I, I call this first update a pre-update oh it's the uh, update that you need before you update yes it updates mm. the updating part of the phone. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Crazy talk. So it was, it was released without any warning, essentially. You know, in other words, we didn't know it was coming. And uh, it happened while I was away. And I saw the, you know, the note that it had happened. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm putting this thing on my phone. Yeah, you were you know, smart. Here. You were smart. Uh, so you well, knew. You kind of had a sense. I didn't. Well, <laughs> let's just say things haven't gone so well with these guys. So I'm not saying I don't trust them, but... Uh, I, I didn't also didn't have the opportunity. I did check to see if it was being made available to me, and it wasn't. So I guess I lucked out because, like you, I have a Samsung Focus. So um, now that the dust has settled, what, what it appears has happened is that, according to Microsoft, approximately 10% of all Windows uh, phones, or about 17 or 18 devices, uh, is, uh, <laughs> would, would have an issue with this update. Um, a lot of them appear to be Samsung devices, um, both the Focus here in the United States and then the, uh, the version they sell in Europe and elsewhere. I, I can't think of the model number, but it's essentially the Focus with a slightly different body. Um, this thing could, uh, you know, uh, fail at a certain point during setup. It could actually brick the phone in some cases, meaning you oh, could even nice. reset it. Yeah, That's what I look for in an update. <laughs> yeah. So Microsoft, you know, uh, I'm trying not to be too negative here, but, you know, they handled it in their usual um, fashion, slowly and <laughs> opaquely. With not, well, no, I have to I give them some credit. Actually, after the fact, they did publish a blog post saying, hey, you guys have told us you want more information. So here it is. And they, they did. They did. They, they blocked about it. And apparently the update will be re, uh, made available again sometime in the coming days with, an, with a fix <laughs> so that if you have one of the affected devices, it will actually work. Now, what this is going to enable, of course, is that real first update, the one we've been waiting for, the, the no-do update, the one that has copy and paste and marketplace search improvements and the application performance improvements and so forth. So uh, that will be happening uh, soon. <laughs> if you dare. Uh, if you dare. I, well, right. I mean, <laughs> based, I, which is an interesting point because 
I mean, <laughs> you know, if this is how it goes with a, a small update, right? I mean, how bad is it going to be for a real update? Yeah. Well, there's an right. old saying for that. Um, first time bricked, shame on you. <laughs> yes. Second time bricked, shame on me. You know, I, we, I had a, my house burned down one time because of a Christmas tree. Wow. When I was uh, still living with my parents. So that's I traumatic. I didn't 20 years old or oh, something. Oh, I'm so sorry yeah. to hear yeah, that. The house, so the house burns down. Terrible. So the people who know that this happened, and it happened because we had a real tree. My dad threw part of it in the fireplace and it, you know. <laughs> Boom. Because yeah. it's soaked in uh, pine tar, pitch. Yeah, Boom. it turns out those things are explosive. Highly because flammable. So, yeah, so the house burned down. And uh, years later, you know, years Good after Lord, the fact, your dad must have been so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, it was stupid. Everyone's okay. You know, I, you know, no, I thank God. No pets were lost. Well, actually, we did lose a pet. But, Fluffy? Uh, <laughs> actually, it's, uh, it's very close to the dog's name. I'm trying to think of the dog's name. Your dog died? Yeah. God, no. Paul, this is turning out worse. It's a long time. Anyway, forget it. Don't worry about it. So years and years I'm after I'm traumatized. This, forget okay. about it's it. It's no problem. But I, I've always had a live tree since then and over the years a number of people who know about this earlier event have said to me didn't you have a you had a house burned down because of a christmas tree right and i said yeah you know well, why do you i mean aren't you worried about that at all <laughs> and i said listen if it happens again uh, that will be it <laughs> no second time <laughs> no, no the second time that, that's just me being dumb yeah yeah well i think you now know enough not to throw it in the fireplace Right. And I right. hope that people at home listening have learned a lesson, too. Yeah, so when you tell that story to people, not to beat the, the Christmas tree thing to death, um, uh, there's a, a certain group of people who have no idea that this can happen, and then there's the other group of people who can see it coming because they already know that right. this is what happens to those kinds of trees. Yeah. Burst, I didn't know this. Burst into myself. flames. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it went right up the... It was unbelievable. <laughs> Burst into flames. Yeah. Uh, and we tied that to Microsoft's system update for Windows. Yeah, so the phone house burning down is a lot like this, this Windows Phone update. Got it. <laughs> so, which you can see Got why it. I thought of that. I've learned uh, from Tom Merritt now to keep the thread of thought going. <laughs> yes, Normally, I just go. Woo! Nicely done. Uh, no, so uh, this will enable this update. Now, one of the other things that's happened this week is that uh, Sprint announced their first Windows Phone, Ooh. and it's coming on March 20th. And that timing is very interesting because Microsoft had said previously that this first update would ship sometime in the first half of March. And, of course, March 20th is in the second half of March. And this first update includes the code needed for Windows Phone to work with CDMA networks uh, on which... So they'll have to update it based. by March yeah. 20th. Well, or... You know, uh, there are apparently phones out in the world now. I think some were being sold in India uh, by mistake, perhaps, and then some will 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 be uh, will be sold in the United States uh, that include this first update. So the Sprint phone will include that update one out of the box. You will have to uh, because right. that's what enables it. Who's uh, do you know whose hardware they're using or anything? About yeah, it's HTC. Oh, good. Yeah, and apparently the first Verizon phone, if I'm not mistaken, is also HTC. I'd have to go back and look at that one up. And Verizon's that, that, will come out. I guess if they're going to do a CDMA phone, they might as well do Verizon. There is, there the is a Verizon time. coming. Yeah, yeah, it's coming uh, roughly the same time. Weeks, it's it's weeks away. Yeah. I, you know what? Believe it or not, and I know it's a little contrarian. I like Sprint. I kind of I don't have any experience with Sprint. Um, you know, my let me think about that for a second. I did. We used uh, my brother and I used the Sprint uh, mobile. You know, like a MiFi type of device right. uh, driving down to Florida, and that actually worked pretty well. But as a phone, I've not really used Sprint. You kind of, I, you know, uh, Sprint and T-Mobile both as the also rands of the phone industry. Yeah, yeah, uh, can be better because you don't have as many people uh, sharing the data and the mm -hmm. bandwidth and stuff. And Sprint's, I think, Sprint's data is actually very. No, there, fast. there are definitely advantages to going with smaller guys sometimes. Right. I guess it depends. I think everyone's needs vary. Uh, you know, uh, Verizon is clearly the king for this country, but yes. then again. If you live in a certain area, it's not going to matter. If, you, if right. you can't get Verizon service where you live, then Verizon is not the phone for you. You know, as, as a traveler, I would say Verizon is probably the best choice for someone who has to go around the country. Um, well, well, U.S. AT only. U.S. only. U.S. only. U.S. only. Yeah. As soon as you go out of the country, it's the worst choice. Yeah. Well, you know, they have world phones. I mean, I'm not. I, 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 I've not looked at their packages for international usage. I'm not sure what those are like, but. Um, you know, AT&T's gotten a lot better. I think we've talked about this a little bit. You know, they get a lot of 
um, you know, bad press and, and um, bad uh, ratings and so forth. But I mean, uh, you know, they, they've gotten better. They've, they've certainly gotten better. But there are definitely areas where they're lousy. You know, I drive, you drive out in the middle of Colorado like I have to do when I go to work, you know, where my work office is. And it's, you might as well be on the moon. You know, there's no, the GPS has you out 300 miles in the desert right. somewhere. And yeah. you know, they, the phone doesn't work. It's just the way it is, you know. Well, and this really emphasizes the advice we used to give. It all changed in 97 when the, uh, I'm sorry, 97, 2007 when the iPhone came out. Yeah. Uh, which was choose your carrier first based on coverage in your area or where you go. Well, maybe that will be the case very soon. It seems like the iPhone is going to head to more carriers. and then, I think it's already the case because every uh, carrier at least has, if you know, yeah. they don't have the iPhone, but they have everyone a has Android. Android phone. And everyone some, will have Windows, Windows phone. Phones. So you have good smartphone choices on every carrier now. Yeah. You don't oh, have yeah, to yeah. have to have the AT&T iPhone. It's not right. In other words, uh, when, when the iPhone first came out, if you wanted the iPhone, you sort of had to make do with AT&T. Yeah. Oof. Uh, I don't think that's the case anymore. I really don't. But if you want an iPhone now, at least you have choice. And hopefully later you'll have more choice. And then, uh, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't really have any sprint experience, so I can't really say. I guess I, I think that people who live in certain areas will know, you know, which carriers happen to be best there. You, uh, I remember when I left that you were predicting that Nokia would use uh, Microsoft's Windows Phone Seven, and they did, didn't they? Announce that they were going to do that while I was gone. Yeah, I don't know that I was predict. I mean, I think this. You was thought this, it would happen. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was hoping that they would do something a little more dramatic. I think that both companies need a little bit of a push over a cliff to get them, you know, <laughs> to the right state of agitation about their uh, current market share, state, and so forth. But uh, it seems like they have, it's not obviously as simple as they're just another Windows phone uh, phone maker. You know, they're, they're also going to work very closely with Microsoft. So there's a special relationship there. But it seemed to me like they, they should have done something very dramatic, i.e. a merger or Microsoft buying Nokia or whatever. And that that would have sent this message that, you know, Microsoft in particular is serious right. about this because I think right now there's a sense that even though I know from talking to the company and people at the company, Microsoft is serious about Windows Phone. You know, Microsoft was serious about Zoom too, by the way, three four years ago. I'm but try not to laugh. Yeah, well, no, but they were. Was, I mean, let me ask: words, was was Microsoft? I mean, you know, Microsoft. They're always, I would presume, somewhat serious because it's expensive to launch a product. Right, but right. you you well, have to. Microsoft doesn't just give up on stuff, right? I mean, well, I, yeah, I, wait a minute. Typically, well, the no, Kin? I mean, right, but the Kin is not a big platform play. In other words, so when, they weren't they serious about the Kin. No, they weren't. I mean, I, I, unfor I think unfortunately for the Kin, the the Kin was seen as a a spiritual successor in, in a way to the sidekick. And the problem with the Kin was that it was mm -hmm. delayed and delayed and delayed. I and see. one of the reasons it was delayed was because midstream through its development. Microsoft got rid of Windows Mobile and went right. to Windows Phone. Right. And then some genius said, you know, you need to make this a Windows Phone device, sort of. You know, base it, base it on Windows Phone. And that set it back. And I think by the time that the Kin launched, they had already put enough money into it and resources that they sort of felt obligated in a way to do it. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, I think we can, there are always going to be examples of them killing stuff after V1. But, you know, the Zune was one of those things where, they, you know, they were going after the, not... Not an, an iPod, like a product. They were going after that whole ecosystem. Yeah, it wasn't they challenged just, it head on, and I, I credit them with that. And it was a multi-year deal. You know, in right. other words, the first version achieved whatever, you know, modicum of success, whatever it was, 2% market share or something. That, that wasn't going to kill it. You know, it, it required years of them never making any headway. And they really did have some innovative ideas in there, both in the software and the services and the hardware, too. Um, but... You know, the, the, what happened, happened. I mean, whatever. But, um, you know, Windows Phone is even more important than that when you think about it because it's, A, they branded it Windows, which should show you how uh, they perceive it. But also, you know, this is the next big, you know, this, this is a platform. You know, it's a mobile platform. It's not an iPod. You know, it's not a little, it's not like a phone, like a side little thing. It's, it's, it's a platform. They're called, it's Windows. You know, there's Windows in the server. There's Windows on the web, there's Windows on the PC desktop, there's Windows on the phone. You know, this is, this is a core <laughs> to what they're doing. So yeah. um, I, this, they're serious about it. Um, it doesn't seem like it sometimes, I know, and it certainly doesn't seem like it sometimes to me, but it's, I think it's important to remember that to Microsoft, that they are very serious about this. And uh, <laughs> they're doing the best they can. <laughs>
Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. Don't bug us. We're doing the best you know, we can. Well, yes, it, it's funny because I think what happened to with Windows Phone was that uh, people within the company made the argument correctly that their current strategy was not working. So why don't you let it let us do it? Here's our idea, you know. And it was a small team, and I think that that sort of guerrilla mentality w worked very well in some ways. But I think you're also seeing the limitations of what is somewhat of a small team, you know, comparatively speaking compared to Windows, right, or Office or Windows Server, um, you know, they've been thrust onto a very big stage here. You know, they need to really uh, show up. And I think it's just growing pains is what we're seeing here. So, yeah, look, at least this thing that happened happened with this sort of non-update, you know, the pre-update, as I call it. Right. And not with update one. Imagine, I mean, can you even imagine what the news stories would be like if, Update one failed for ten percent of users, right? But do people make the distinction? I mean, I don't even. I mean, updates and update. well, I think it's uh, it's this is a very minor thing. I mean, uh, you know, the software update itself. Uh, obviously, when you're shipping an update that's going to change the functionality of the phone, it's a bigger deal, I, I would think. You know, in other words, I guess the way I would put it is this: I think that a lot of Windows phones users are going to go out and try to get that first update. They're going to want they want it, so they'll seek it out. This one. You may have heard, oh, there's some update out. It's not that update. Oh, you know, and, and the, the interest goes away. I think that they weren't bitten as hard by that. Um, so we'll, we'll see, <laughs> I guess. But hopefully they get it right, um, you know, for the real update, the real first update, as I, as I think of it. <laughs> <laughs> the actual update instead of this we're not, phony, we're pretend this, this update phone didn't happen. bricking you know, we're, update. We're, gonna, we're just going to look forward. Never, this isn't the update you're looking for. Exactly, yeah. I'm just glad I was in South America. <laughs> that's, that's I like, well, I saw, like I said, I was, I was, I could have done, you know, well, I, I never was offered it, but. Oh, so not I, everybody, not every, it wasn't pushed to everybody. No, not immediately. It would have been over time, but as okay. it was going out, what they discovered was, oh, wait, we have problems. You, know? <laughs> you would think they would have tested this, like, just, you know, take, take, there's how many phones out? Nine at most? <sighs> take, get, my, you know, just a word, a tip. One of each. One of each. <laughs> buy one of each. And try the update. Just see what happens. See, I think the problem is that that is what they did. Oh, and it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't enough. enough. <laughs> yeah, because not, not every phone failed. Not every Samsung failed. Just so maybe it's some weird interaction between the software you've installed and the amount of free space or what. Have they ever solved the SD card issue? No, they've never. They they pretend that that has never happened. You know, and, and I you know, get email. I, this. We've talked I about know. this. You could have done this if you'd done it in 2006 or 2007, but it's too competitive a market right now for you to stumble like this, Microsoft. You can't. You they need to be perfect. They, I, I might, and this, this is not um, a fact. This is my take on this, my opinion, or my guess based on what little I do know about it. But the way I perceive it is that Microsoft was goaded into providing this functionality because. Their wireless carrier partners demanded oh, it. Yeah, and they wanted nothing to do with supporting it. Yeah, still don't. They right. just don't. They want to wipe their hands of this. So, I believe I, I, there are only a handful of phones that have this. And I know that Samsung is one, and I think there's one other that's a non-Samsung, and that's about it. I don't think there's many. Um, they just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. You know? So the the thirty I put a thirty two gig card in mine that I found on Amazon. It works fine. I've never had any issues. Oh. It's still in there. I've never okay. reset the phone. It's oh, good. no problem at all. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I can recommend this to anyone else because other people will buy the same card and it won't problems, work for them. Right. So right. it is one of those trial and error things. But it's a tough thing when it when this doesn't work. What class because, um, is the flash RAM that you're using? Is it a, is class four six? I mean, is it, it like is super fast? Six. It's not it's, six. No, no. It, you know what? The, the performance characteristics of the card are not. Let me see. If I That's can not the it. issue. No, it's well, it's it it is, it doesn't matter. So, the one I have is let's see, <clears throat> it's a it's a Patriot, a genuine Patriot memory card for Samsung Focus <laughs> is how they um, advertise it on Amazon. It is a let's see, actually I don't know. Say. Well, I found it on Amazon. So if you search for, let's say, Patriot memory card for Samsung Focus, you'll come up with it. It's it's expensive now. It's 
Actually, excuse me too. It's also only 16 gigabytes, not 32. But it does say four Samsung Focus. So it you, does. That, which it gives you, I said, what the heck? I'll try I'll this try one. I'll try it. Right. Yeah. And let me see if I mention it in my blog posts about this. No, I don't know. And I guess not. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. I, uh, it, okay, class four. Yeah, I knew class it wasn't the, right. the highest number. No, but that's class it's decently fast. I can't imagine a phone needing more than that, to be honest with you. The only things that need class 6 or 10 are these high-speed cameras, sure. video recorders, things like that. A lot of data. In this. I, I think, you know, <laughs> I've always felt like it would be neat to have the one device, you know, in theory. The truth is you bring your phone with you on a trip, and I'm not going to watch a movie on this thing when I'm flying across the country because I need to use the phone on the other side. But you can do goofy things like, well, you can buy a battery pack. And obviously, there are more seamless battery packs for iPhones because there are more of them in the market, and they have that connector and so forth. But eventually, what you're basically doing is bringing a bunch of extra stuff. So I guess the argument at this point is, if you're going to be bringing extra stuff anyway, you know, maybe you should just have an iPod Touch or a Zoom HD or whatever it is you prefer to use, and use that for Meteor. Meteor. <laughs> uh, Meteor? Me. Did you say Meteor? Did. I apologize. You did. No, me. you're from Boston. So slip In fact, I expect you to say media. <laughs> Use that for media. He's phony when you say media. <laughs> There's an R at the end. Get uh, it right. Meteor. Yes, thank you for watching that. And, did, you grow, um, did you grow up in that in the Dedham area? I, I did. I grew oh. up in Dedham specifically. Actually. Really? Oh, that's neat. So you're a native. I am. You come by your meteor naturally. Sadly, yes. Yes, the data. I told is you I, when we discussed this previously. I said there are cir circumstances where this will happen to me uh, when I'm a drunk and when I'm really tired. <laughs> when he's drunk, he gets wicked, wicked cool, wicked. He, yeah. <laughs> I love you my know, favorite I love episode. The of this, I have two favorite episodes of Simpsons, but one of them is the the family of the um, mayor who has the JFK accent. Yeah, yeah. And, and he gets in trouble with the waiter when he says, "Say chowder, chowder, chowder." chowder. I just love the I love the fake Kennedy accent. <laughs> I do too. Well, we're gonna chowder. say chowder. We're gonna take a break. Come back with more, Paul. In just a moment. Before we do, let me tell you about go to assist. Yeah, go to assist.com slash windows. I'm sounding like the Pepperidge Farm man. I know. Citrix remembers. Go to assist. <laughs> I could drive five minutes and be at a Pepperidge Farm. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Of some kind. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's like a. I like it. A, that's it's kind a, of a main, isn't that a, a down Easter accent kind of? Yeah. 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 Can't get there from here. You gotta watch, you're right. You got to watch uh, Pet Cemetery, the guy who played the judge. Oh, I love that accent. Has that awesome main accent. Yeah. They've lost a fisherman. Right. Let me tell you about Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with Go to Assist Express. It's what I use. Now I'm starting to sound Irish. I don't know how that happens. I've got a real problem with accent drift, if you know what I mean. If you <laughs> right. Suddenly you were in Galway. <laughs> Faith and Megara, if you're an IT or software consultant, I know you're looking ways for ways to become more efficient, more afford, more uh, profitable, certainly, and to grow your business. And this is where Citrix really comes in handy. A lot of uh, the pros already know about Citrix with Windows uh, Remote Access. Citrix does a product just for support professionals called Go to Assist Express. I use it, and it is I can ver I can vouch for it. It's fantastic. First of all, it's easy for your clients. They don't have to have, have it installed ahead of time. Uh, I was on a Skype uh, call with my mom. She said, I need to, I can't find my Intuit data. I said, no problem. I, I said, click this link. And I pasted into the Skype chat the link. Within a minute, she had downloaded, installed the software. It's very easy for her. There's one, one, she has to click yes at one point for permission to uh, install the app. And boom, now I'm in fixing the problem. And what's beautiful is now I, uh, if she gives me permission, can have unattended access to her system so I don't have to wait around for her. I can share my screen with her so she can see what it's supposed to look like and vice versa. Vice versa. Uh, integrated live chat so you can continue that conversation online. And it works for PCs and Mac and it's completely cross-platform. So you can use it on a Mac to fix a PC or vice versa. You can even drag and drop fixes. So if you've got a hot fix or a patch, you just drag it over there and uh, double-click it. You can run up to eight sessions at once. So once you start that patch, 
you're not stuck sitting there watching the hourglass. You can go over to the next one and the next one. That's why you're more efficient. I think they, they were quoting a study that said, go to Assist Express users report a 40% improvement in productivity. It's like two days extra a week. Try it free for 30 days. You, you be the judge. They do have day passes, of course, in the monthly subscription, but this is free for 30 days. Go to the website. Go to assist.com slash windows. G-O-T-O, assist.com slash windows. And, of course, go to assist has free customer service available 24-7. Go to assist.com slash windows. Do you, isn't it funny when you see an old movie? Have you noticed that in the old, like the 30s? They all have, like, British accents. It's very strange. I can't do that, darling. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Why are you talking like that, girl? Why are you talking like that, girlfriend? You stop it. You cut that out. Oh, no, you didn't. Moving right along, speaking of... <laughs> Sorry. Poor Paul. He's tired. He just wants to go to bed. I'm, I'm, I have no idea where I am anymore. <laughs> He's completely lost track of his locale. How was Madrid? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I I've never been to Madrid, but I love Barcelona. I think Spain is cool. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And the yeah. food was great. Great wine. I, Rioja. I honestly the food was the biggest surprise for me because I just I, I mean, obviously the stuff in France is great, but there, there's just uh, I don't know how to explain it, but the, the food there oh, was just notably good. It was uh, one of the amazing. best food experiences well, ever. The, the, not only the oldest restaurant in the world where you went, but many considered no longer open, but many considered the best restaurant in the world, El Bulli, is also in Madrid. Mm. Was yeah. in Madrid. Is it El Bulli or El Bulli? I don't know. <laughs> yes. The other thing is, you know, Spanish is the easiest language in the world. Um... You know, my wife and I, my wife knows some French. I know a little bit of French. Right. Um, if you know a romance language, think. yeah. But these languages are inscrutable. Um, Spanish, for whatever reason, is is very simple. My wife, you know, and I were both picking up, th you know, the types of things you wouldn't normally be able to pick up, either something recorded over the, you know, the subway system or the voice of a guy calling out something in a restaurant or whatever it was. We could, we find ourselves understanding way more. Mm-hmm than has ever happened uh, in any you know, other place. It's funny, I had the same experience because I was in Argentina, Chile, mm -hmm. and Peru, all Spanish-speaking, and in fact, kind of more Spanish-style yeah. sp uh, Spanish than Mexican-style mm -hmm. Spanish. Right, Even right. Castilian in some areas. And, yeah. uh, and I thought, you know, I got this strong sensation. If I stayed here a few right. months, I could pick this up. My, my wife said, we should just leave the TV on and we'll be fluent by the time we go home. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. There oh. is something neat about that. I loved it. Yeah, it doesn't happen in France. You know, uh, French is a very complicated language, like English, that has a million special cases mm -hmm. and has inscrutable rules about what things are feminine and what things are masculine. Right, so it's yeah. crazy. But doesn't Whereas, Spanish have uh, a... Spanish is... No, but it's all very... Uh, it's very it's clear. What is. It's scrutable. Yeah, it's scrutable. <laughs> That's a good word. It's disinscrutable. I wish it were a word, but it's it, it should be a word. Because if, if, if inscrutable is a word, then scrutable should also be a word. As my friend Sean said, it's below reproach. <laughs> Not above, but below. <laughs> right. Why isn't scrutable a word? I don't know. And flammable means flammable? I know, English. You See, know, this is was, why, in yeah. fact, we were saying this, uh, my wife and I, were, when we were in Peru, we we're, were apologizing. We we're saying, you know, I'm sorry, right. English is so hard. You know, sure. and uh, they all try very hard to speak English, and many of them speak English well. Although I was intrigued yeah. because my experience in France and uh, in other countries is that uh, a lot of people do know English. In Chile, very few people that I ran into knew English. They, there didn't seem to be any urge to learn English. We have the same experience everywhere we go, which is you run it, you know, you have to ask someone a question or buy a ticket or whatever it is, and you say in their language, do you speak English? And they say no, and then you say okay, and then you kind of plot ahead and... Uh, it works out very well in France. It worked out horribly in Germany. That Germany is crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, rural Germany where they don't speak English, uh, you're on your own. That's <laughs> like being on a different planet. But in Spain, it was very easy. Yeah. Every time. It's no interesting. problem. I had the same experience. Yeah. It was fun. I, boy, I, I love Latin America. I have to say, I, I, mm. if, I, I highly encourage you at some point to. Uh, yeah, to I'll get there. Track. It's really wonderful. It's going to take some time. but Windows 7 Service Pack 1 it came out while I was gone, too. 
Yeah, a lot of the, there were a lot of milestones for service back when we were gone. You know, they they released it to manufacturing, then they released it to MSDN and TechNet and to volume licensing, and then this past week they released it publicly. That's so great. That's great. It's up there on Windows Update if you want to get it that way. Um, that should be the easiest way, unless you're obviously a system administrator and need it for other purposes. But um, take about half an hour to install. And uh, as with any classic service pack, if you do it right, when everything's done, you should notice nothing. <laughs> you know, so that's <laughs> kind of the way it works. You know. Exactly the same as it ever was. Yeah. That's Which sounds dumb, but again, no, that's in the world of want. service packs, that's what you're looking for. If it's a choice between that and bricking my phone, right. I'll pick that every time. There's a new Windows Phone ad that just uh, came out. Have you seen this one yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Should I play? Should I play it just for people who haven't mm -hmm. who don't, haven't watched it? This is the What If commercial, and I'm sure if uh, it, with the cooperation of this YouTube, is, you know, what if the most beautiful phone in the room was also the yeah, smartest? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do it for me, and then I don't have to play this video? <laughs> you, you, you know, every time an ad like this comes out, you sort of scrutinize it to see if there's any hidden new app in there yeah i'm not hearing anything no it's no sound why not why not so it's like netflix mm -hmm. which is already around and was it open table probably the game stuff which is awesome a little portable xbox right there it's a nice demo and dango ebay, eBay. yelp oh yeah so nothing we have thousands of apps thousands Ninety nine bucks. More than hundreds. I, I did see that ninety nine dollars at the end there though. That's good. Yeah, you know, I was uh, my wife has an Android phone, and I was talking to her about apps and phones and and all this stuff. And you know, we loaded the kids up with some apps on their iPods, so they had stuff to do on the trip. You know, when we were flying and so forth. And I was wondering, I was uh, curious what she thought about this, and I guess I'm I'm curious what you think about this too. Is just the notion of app overload. I mean, after a certain point, you know, the I iOS has two gajillion apps or whatever it is, and uh, Android has half a gajillion apps now, and Windows Phone has whatever, 8,000, 10,000 apps, probably somewhere in there. Um, you know, at some point, is there's a number, I think, where you cross where it's just enough, you know, and obviously it's, it's about quality of apps too, you know, and certain apps being available, right? There are certain apps that aren't yet on Windows Phone uh, that will be very important to have, and it, they'll, and they'll occur. But I, I wonder at what point where Windows Phone just crosses the line where it's not a compromise anymore of any kind, you know, um, yeah. where all those apps that are so important are there. And right. Well, they're close. The I mean, that's the point of that ad, obviously, right? The apps you want. We won't mention numbers, but the apps you want, we've got. Are there, yeah. So yeah. Th what made me think of this actually was I, I had to go into uh, the iTunes app store to find those games for my kids. And I don't play games on an iPod or... I do a little bit on the iPad just to kind of check out what's going on there because obviously it's a new platform and everything, but I don't, I don't play a lot of games on these things. And I was curious to see what had changed with regards to, you know, iPod touch and iPhone games since the last time I did this, which was months ago. In fact, the last time I really did it in any meaningful way was the last time we went away with the kids, you know, from last August. So it's been six months, let's say, or whatever. And I was really surprised by how hard it was to find anything new that was worth downloading, you know, based on the reviews, the recommendations that you see inside the, you know, inside the iTunes app in the app store. And I had a hard time because I, I sort of thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll, if I could find 10 or 12 games, you know, uh, some mixture of paid and free games, this would be a great number. And I, I, I actually couldn't do it. I, I, I think I found maybe seven or eight. And then while we were there, I, I downloaded three or four more or something. Um, I had a hard time and they've, they've settled into these routines, you know, where there are Angry Bird like games and then there are these games I call like runner. I think they're called running games or runner games where basically the thing is just scrolling across the screen and what you control is the up and down movement where you kind of move around stuff or you do things or whatever. And, and I, 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 I'm wondering now with these uh, touchscreen form factors, if something has changed where there, there's a certain class of game that works really well in this and now there are a lot of them. You know, yeah. that if people, well, and, I think that partly was people learning the, um, uh, the mechanics mechan of it, and, you know, uh, the, 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 yeah. the dialect, the, uh, the lingo of touch. Right. You know? No. And, and, by, and when you say that, it's interesting because I think what you mean by that are developers, right? Not just, yes, not, not just users. users. No, 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 no. The Although game there is some of that as well, right? Like in other words, some, some, you, you sort of learn over time just from experience that some 
user interactions work really well on these devices, you know, and some don't. I mean, that's the analog to that, I guess. Absolutely. You know, some, some do and some don't. So there's you know, like you try to play games like Quake and it just so doesn't much. work. Yeah, yeah. Although but, the new Dead Space works pretty well, whatever that's worth. Yeah, well, like the I, Call of Duty zombies, same thing. It's 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 it it's wants a game. Happen. It wants a game control. No, no. You need you need the two hats, and you need yeah. It's but, a but, different. But that's exactly why uh, Angry Birds works so well. It's just a freaking it's slingshot. Pure touchscreen and yeah. it's physics and it's fun. Yeah, and it it, it it it's the right combination of things, and that's why there are so many ripoffs of it. You know. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm wondering is just if we reach some saturation point. You know, Microsoft is never going to have the a couple hundred thousand apps that uh, iPhone has or whatever. And I don't think they have to. I mean, I think no, uh, ten thousand is maybe not enough, but at some point there you, is you a number. Cross a line. Yeah, yeah. And How I'm many? They're going to get there this year. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, it's funny because um, Turnabout is fair play. As a Mac user for years, <laughs> yes, 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 that yes, we yes. had the same conversation because Windows Absolutely. users would say, "Oh, don't buy a Mac. There's so few apps for it." And we'd say, "But the apps I need." You have the apps that you want. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm not sure if that was necessarily always the case just as it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah, always the case true right but that was our defense <laughs> that was always the yes, yes no yes. it's the same it's, it's fun it's, being on the other side of the fence leo yeah. thank you for that this has been a nice um, how do you feel nice about now? face for me it's no. like i woke up in someone else's yard you know what happened all my junk is on the you know on the ground <laughs> <laughs> you know you, please feel free to move in this, this is yours now Enjoy. whoa you mean now <laughs> i'm the minority whoa yeah, yeah. No, that's good stuff uh, I'm surprised to see this on your rundown. Windows Home Server. I thought we'd uh, written that one off. Veil is out now? or is well, this... So you may recall. <laughs> yes, I do. My, my, <laughs> I vividly I, I, do. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to go over what happened, but but you may recall my advice, uh, so to, such as it was at the time, which was Microsoft was going to, in January, release some new pre-release version of this where there would be some kind of nod toward, well, here's some bit of functionality that has a little bit of that drive extender stuff, and maybe it will or will not make up for it. And we'll make a decision on Veil, you know, the new version of Home Server, based on what it looks like. You know, when, let's wait until we get that final pre-release version. So it was actually early uh, February when they finally released it, but what they shipped was the release candidate version of the product. And I, I installed it not on my main server box but on a, a different machine a physical machine i wanted to really use the thing put some content on there and see what it looks like and i i wanted to really evaluate whether you know i could use this thing going forward i mean because I, right now my home infrastructure like you know as i call it i don't know it's not much of an infrastructure but my my home network is based around windows home server and i i use it for not just uh, digital media, you know, photos and music and videos and so forth, but also all of my important work-related documents dating back, by the way, all the way to the mid to early 1990s. I mean, I've wow. got all kinds of stuff. On there. I'm jealous. Through. I'm jealous because I have a lot of stuff that I've lost forever. They're on floppies. Oh, no, I do too. I have I definitely Zip have disks. But I have, like, you know, years and years and years of stuff. So <clears throat> uh, looking at this thing, you know, the drive, in, the drive extender loss is felt. I mean, let, let's be honest about that. And, and I think that the piece that's not going to be replaced is the single pool of storage. I think that that's the big deal. And it is kind of a big deal. But, but if you look at it logically, um, given the size of hard drives today, what this means is that for any given share, for any given content type, you know, uh, whether it's videos, photos, music, uh, documents, whatever, the biggest that thing can be a share today is two terabytes because that's the physical limitations of the disks we have right now. now. That will change over time, but right now I have a bunch of two terabyte disks. If you, if, when I look at my own shares, the biggest amount of stuff I have in one place is my videos, and most of them aren't that important, frankly. They're movie rips and things like that, and it's about 1.6 uh, terabytes. So even as of today, I'm not exceeding this limit, and if I do... I suppose you could have a, you know, making a second share for videos is not such a huge deal, right? Because there are logical ways in which I can separate them out. But when I look at my other data, and I almost <laughs> completely Boston butchered that phrase, but I got it out. Um, <laughs> Come I see on, or, you want to say data? Go ahead. It's like other data. You other know. When data. I, um, when I look at this other other data, I I see much smaller file sizes or storage requirements. You know. Roughly, uh, like, for example, my photo collection, which is about a decade of digital photos, 
uh, and some scans, but mostly digital photos. 225 gigabytes. Not even close, right, to two terabytes. You know, my music collection is under 50 gigabytes. My software collection is under 200 gigabytes. The documents I talked about um, dating back over a decade, almost a decade and a half in some cases, 250 gigabytes, roughly speaking, I think. So, you know, that, although it would have been nice to have that single pool of storage, it's not really killing me, right? It's not, it's not, that's not a, a big deal. And then the other aspect to um, Drive Extender was data duplication, where automatically it would push each file onto two different physical hard drives so that if one failed, um, you wouldn't lose your data. Now, the way they get around that with Veil is by having a better version of server backup. So uh, the thing I need to test and is just the storage requirements. You can set up store, uh, server backup to back up. Uh, I, think, I think by default it's twice a day. You could, you could have it back up every, I think, 30 minutes if you wanted to. That's a little excessive. But the question is going to be how much storage you need for this to be effective. So... To have something where your data is essentially being duplicated because it's being backed up. So it's not being duplicated on the fly, but it is being backed up, let's say, two to four times a day. Let's say twice a day. I mean, how much is it really that much worse than data duplication? If it's on a different physical disk, right? Uh, you know, at least halfway through the day. I mean, so I guess at most you would lose like half a day's worth of data. It's not that bad, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the only question is whether this thing requires a lot more storage. And that's what I'm going to have to find out. So I'm going to figure that out. So I have, right now I have a mess of uh, two terabyte disks. I'm going to see how much I need for the actual source data, you know, the original file shares, and then how much I need for, for server backup. And that's going to be the big question. The other thing is, you know, we're not talking about a NAS device here, right? I mean, uh, Windows Home Server does a lot of stuff. And, I, and when I wrote about this, one of the things I, and I did this partially to remind myself, I went, and, the, and where I came up with this list is, I went back to my original review of Windows Home Server and I said, okay, well, what was the deal? Like, what, how was this thing being pushed at the time? And it was automatic centralized PC backup of all, mm -hmm. all your PCs, right, mm -hmm. up to 10. Health uh, monitoring for the home network, right. which is great. Centralized uh, storage seamless, media, yep, right? Yep. yep, and sharing in a sharing. Windows-friendly way, mm -hmm. document sharing as well. And then mm -hmm. remote access. So from outside of your home network, you can remote access into your network in, in various ways. This includes a web-based interface to all of your files in the server, a standard remote desktop interface to the server itself, if you want to do it that way, or a standard remote desktop-based interface to any of the PCs in your home network as well. It's actually very powerful. And it does. Now, it still does all of that with that media, with that drive It still extended. does all of that. And the new version has new stuff, including Mac support, uh, Windows Phone support, um, better remote access. It's got uh, better uh, digital media sharing based on DLNA right now. Uh, now, I should say. And, uh, and then also this um, uh, better server backup, you know, which is a big deal. So I, I, to me, it's, you know, when you, when you find out they're getting rid of something like Drive Extender, it's a big deal because it is kind of the heart of the product. But then you have to be pragmatic about it. Well, it, it's not just about storage, right? It's all this other stuff. So if I was just going to get a NAS box, which I guess you could do some kind of a RAID thing maybe or whatever it is, or Drobo or something, what about all this other stuff? You know, how do I replace that? And it's actually pretty hard. You know, it's easy to forget what a Swiss army knife this thing is. It does all this stuff. Well, geeks have figured this out, but but we're talking about normal people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Geeks, geeks do all of that. No, it, it, right. And actually, it's a good point. So here's here's another uh, another little thing to think about, I guess. This is for me, you know. For people out there who have Windows Home Server now, you don't have to change anything. I mean, right. I need to move on to the new one because I have to write about it and this is what I do for a living and all that stuff. Um, if you have Windows Home Server 1.0 now, I mean, A, you can't update, you know, you can't upgrade anyway, but that's not really the point unless you built the server yourself and you wanted to wipe it out or whatever. But essentially speaking, the thing is an appliance, right? It's designed to work like, like a NAS box or whatever. It's just like a, or a toaster or a DVD player. It's just a, it's a, it's an appliance. Um, the advent of Windows Home Server 2011 or the removal of Drive Extender from that product doesn't change how your product works. This thing will keep working, not, not forever, but it will keep working for years and years. So I think for normal people who have adopted Windows Home Server, none of this changes anything. I mean, their server continues to work. You can keep adding storage to it. You can keep adding files to you can keep using it. it. All the stuff that was there before will obviously 
continue to work. So uh, this is just for my own thing. So I am going to use it. I mean, the, the decision for me was whether I went to their more small business oriented version of the software, the Aurora stuff, which is a small business server 2011 essentials, or to something else, whatever that something else may be, Trobo, NAS, whatever. But ultimately, for my own purposes, it just it seems like Windows Home Server is still the best solution for what I need and for what we actually use around the house. So I'm going to keep using it. And I, I think that uh, looked at unemotionally, because it is easy to get caught up in the, you know, the emotion of the stuff. Um, it's still the right choice. Yeah. Oh, and I just wanted to add too, I, I've gotten dozens and dozens of email from people who have found out on the web and there are various home server sites and so forth. Um, there are third parties who are creating replacements for a drive extender. So these things will probably be delivered as a plug-in for Windows Home Server 2011. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, there you go. Yeah, except, well, except for one thing. I, I just want to remind people that this is your data, <laughs> you know, and these third parties, we don't know who they are. You know, it's not Microsoft. It's not some company we've ever heard of. It could be a couple of guys in a garage, which is fine. But I can tell you that right now, there's no way I would ever consider using something like that personally because this is my data, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, I suppose in, in conjunction with server backup, it might be okay or safe, but remember too, that when you do that, you're uh, ex expanding the amount of storage you need because now you need twice as much storage for the drive extender type um, capability, plus another half again for server backup plus, I don't know, again, we don't know how much that's gonna require. So. Uh, I, I would give that some time. <laughs> I think it's my point there. Uh, some of these things may prove themselves to be reliable and safe. Some of them may be shipped and then never updated. I, I think we need to give that stuff some time. I'd be very careful about anything that touches your data. Is you know just my basic advice. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But you don't have any reason to think that these are not good. Just no, they're no, untested. No, no, they're unproven. It's just that they've all been very hastily announced. You know, now that Microsoft right. is not doing this, well, here's something that will do this. And it's like, eh, okay. You know, I mean, I think the appeal of Drive Extender is that it was part of the OS. And and the real appeal for it uh, of it for me was that it was eventually going to go into all versions of Windows. And we were going to have, you know, a single pool uh, of storage on the client version of Windows, which would be awesome, and no drive letters, which would be awesome, and data duplication, which of course is awesome. And this all sounded great. But now that it's gone... I don't know that I would trust a third party to that quite yet. So let's right. let's see how that one plays out first. Yeah. We, uh, as long as we're talking about kind of this notion of connectivity, what happens when you leave the house? <laughs> yeah, so I, as I do when I travel, I always I think about... This is when this comes up. I remember the last technology. time you were in Europe, you you were using Windows Homes. You were kind of boldly, you installed the beta the day you left. Yeah, I know. And you boldly and I, went uh, no, where no geek has gone I did, before. Yeah, and I, yeah. I would hit that thing every day remotely. I would back up all my photos to it, which we did also for Madrid. Um, I love that kind of thing. But, you know, I when I travel like you, I'm sure, um, I look at what people are doing on computers and devices and things. And I look... Uh, to see what's on those screens. You know, I walk up the plane or the train or whatever I'm on and I look at the screens and I see, and I, you know, I can tell you over the years, you know, the trends have changed pretty dramatically. I remember for years and years and years, it was a sea of Dell laptops and everyone was playing solitaire. Uh, with the <laughs> of Excel, and that yes, was basically it. You're right. I mean, you're was, right. You know, um, when I flew to Denver last month, I sat in the exit row on a plane where every single person in that row had an iPad except for one guy mm -hmm. and he had Samsung De Galaxy Tab. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is a big change. The, the other big change uh, is that, I, in, it's in the United States at least, I see a lot of MacBooks around in the real world. <laughs> you know, whereas I would say two years ago back, I would see them in press rooms, yes, because right. people who are in the press love Macs. But I wouldn't see them out in the real world. And now I do. I really you know do. what? I was surprised to see a lot of MacBook Airs on the plane. Yes, I actually saw so, um, the Denver flight. I saw someone with a MacBook Air and an external DVD drive watching a movie. Oh, no, that's just strange. That's <laughs> just stupid. But um, <laughs> You don't see a lot, you know, it's in Europe, uh, in Madrid anyway, lots of uh, Nokia phones. Absolutely. In fact, ads for new phones. I, I, did, I only saw maybe two, maybe three iPhones in the entire country when I was there, but... Um, 
it's a different mix of and a lot of the little phones you know not the big smartphones like we uh, think of them now but little slider phones and uh, people that look like they were running little apps and you know different things it's an interesting different mix but um you know we've talked about the theme here where you know the future of computing is very clearly mobile and connected and for that to happen a lot of things have to happen i know people listening from australia for example have uh, very expensive tiered data, and to them, this is this is a distant dream. And I, I think the connectivity stuff we're still some ways away. Oh because man, did I feel that uh, on this trip? You know, it, it's I have all these great connectivity solutions, but without yeah. adequate bandwidth, means nothing. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, even in the United States, it's a problem. Uh, you know, there is no real seamless way with most computers to switch from network to network. And just have it work, you know. Every network, if you just talking wireless, for example, or Wi-Fi, for example, you know, when you're you're in a laptop and you have to hit a wireless network, I mean, every wireless network has its own stupid web-based login kind of thing. Yeah. Click here to watch a free video or watch a video, and then you can get free access to the airport. And it's all this stupid stuff, you know. And it's it and it's neat that we can get online at all, but we we kind of jump through hoops to make it happen. And then the the actual quality of the connection varies incredibly wildly, like. Um, when I was in Colorado, where you'd think the connection would be fantastic, it was like being on dial-up through a cable in my hotel room. But then we go to France, uh, to Spain rather, and the the quality of that Wi-Fi network, like I said, it was backing up my photos, uh, posting photos to Facebook every day, also uploading photos to the Google Picasso web. It was as fast as it would be for me here at home. I mean, it's crazy how all over the map it is. But... The one thing that has changed in the past year, and it, this is just the biggest thing in the world, and it, it is so important, and it has really fulfilled 50% of that mobile and connected piece, is battery life. At least on computing devices, not so much on smartphones. But, um, you know, Apple's laptops have, uh, for the past few years have gotten phenomenal battery life. Uh, when I was away, I got a, an email from Lenovo about some ThinkPads that they subsequently released. <laughs> they, have a, they have a laptop coming out next month that gets... 15 hours of battery life with a standard battery, and then you can pop out the DVD drive and put in a little slice in there, and then it gets 30 hours of battery life. That's probably that new Sandy Bridge uh, mobile right, part, right? Right, it is. Yeah. It's a T, it's T420, and they have a T420S that gets slightly under it, somewhere in the 24-hour range with the extended battery. And then they have a, an X220 coming out, same deal. And these... And then, of course, the new MacBooks, where Apple is, I think, using a new system for determining the battery life. You know, uh, yeah, because they went down. They went down. But, but now they they're not lying. <laughs> they're not lying, yeah. And I think it's possible if you're doing something different. You know, for whatever reason, I've noticed uh, Apple devices in particular, if you're doing something like watching a movie, you think this would kill the battery. Right. But actually, it does better just watching a movie. So if you're in an offline situation where you're on a plane watching a movie... Um, I bet they do better than the seven hours that they have their own systems rated for. And and then there's the iPad, you know, and for all the problems of the iPad with the screen reflection and all that, you know, those are things that Apple is absolutely going to fix probably as soon as next week. But the battery life on that thing is phenomenal. It's crazy. And on my flight home from Spain, of course, I'm jammed into some, you know, uh, carriage class thing like cattle and there's six inches between me and the seat in front of me. So I'm not, I'm not getting any work done. I'm not even going to pretend. So I watched movies on the iPad the entire way home and seven hours in the air, that kind of thing. Um, I think when I got home, it was the, the battery life was at like 60%, you know, something wow, like that. That's amazing. 60%. I mean, I, Battery life is, is just not a problem. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. if you have a modern device, uh, I think that that's been solved. You know, so I think you now we have to turn our attention to this connectivity thing. I think that's going to be, that's the big deal, frankly. And then the issues associated with it. So, for example, when I'm in Spain or France or Germany, whatever, I can't access Netflix. Uh, Amazon announced that uh, streaming service. So I wanted to check that out, but it detected I wasn't in the United States, even though... I have had an account with Amazon for years and years. They know I'm from the United States. I'm paying for it with a credit card from the United States, right? They still can't stream it to me when I'm away without doing some hokey, um, you have you to know, know, trickery. Proxy whatever. it, yeah. Yeah, proxy it. Yeah. At, a, at a cost, you know, per month or whatever. Well, and speed issues too. 
Yeah, probably. Yeah. But, you know, it, I think so that stuff needs to be worked out. But I think that's related to bandwidth, right? I think these are essentially, this is to, to, to bandwidth is sort of like licensing issues with music. You know right. how right. Uh, it's different per, from country to country. I think that it's a related concept. Um, it's just something that needs to be worked out. But obviously the big thing is just bandwidth, is connectivity. And uh, it's something that we certainly haven't solved in the United States. And maybe it has been solved in certain countries uh, to different degrees. But it's, you know, it's one of those things. And uh, the cost of bandwidth is crazy. You know, I paid $50, actually $60 for 50 megabytes of uh, 3G data through my Windows phone through AT&T, which is, it's wonderful that it's available. But you know, it's expensive, right? I mean, I can't just, I can't, can't go to Europe and leave my phone on like a normal person. You, know, you have to kind of manage it. And um, I'd like to see that stuff get better. But yeah, every time I go away, I think about this stuff. And of course, the big trips, like the international trips is, it, uh, you know, is a <laughs> kind of a broader set of issues, of course, around this stuff. But it's interesting how it's all kind of coming together. I think, I think we'll get there. Yeah. Before we uh, get to our next topic, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, our friends. At, you you must do invoicing from time to time, do you? Yeah. In fact, we had an ad for this probably last week, and I was I. You need to try this. I actually recommended this to my wife because she also does. Yeah. She does more than I do, actually. I use it for years. Now we have I have people. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, you're right. Well, having people would be good too. Yeah, there's one one way to go. But if you're a freelancer, a small business, yep. and you need to invoice people, and you want to do it the easiest way, do it online with FreshBooks.com. I love FreshBooks. It makes it easier to invoice, of course, but also easier to get paid, which is kind of nice. Uh, you can upload your company logo, so those invoices look great. You, they'll email them, but you also for an additional price, you can print them and have them mailed, which I often did. Some some clients really want a paper copy. Uh, of course, clients can download a PDF of the invoice as well. And then when it comes time to pay, they can pay, of course, by mailing you a check or by a credit card or PayPal or 11 other electronic payment services. So it's very easy for them to pay you. You want to make it easy for them to give you money, believe me. FreshBooks also uh, includes automated late payment reminders to follow up with clients. Uh, it does time tracking. Uh, you can log your hours, consolidate your timesheets right into the invoice. Uh, they even have an iPhone app that will do this, track your time and invoice your customers when you're away from the office. FreshBooks, 2 million people use FreshBooks since uh, 2004. I'm one of them. I, I, was, I, love, I kind of miss using FreshBooks. I really do. It was really a great thing. I'll tell you what, try it right now. FreshBooks.com. FreshBooks.com. And it's, uh, it's free for up to three of your clients. It takes you about a minute to set up the account. Freshbooks.com. Do, when they ask you how you heard about it, do mention you heard it with uh, Paul and Windows Weekly. Fresh. It's fresh. It's fresh. <laughs> fresh. Let's talk about Connect, which is uh, one of the bright lights in the Microsoft firmament for 2010. Yeah, as, I, as I call it, the, the rare win for Microsoft in the consumer <laughs> column. Yeah. And now they got an SDK. Yeah, they've got one coming out for, it's hard to know how to categorize this. They have described it as a, let's see, where is a non-commercial software development kit. Uh, so essentially for enthusiasts, but I think also for these different kinds of markets, you know, even things like healthcare and they, they, they sort of see this Connect device being used in a lot of different places that I think are some of which are going to surprise people. So hmm. this is kind of interesting. It's for Windows. It's not a, it's not a software desktop. development. Desktop. Desktop. It is yes. for Windows desktop. Think desktop. Yeah, that's very interesting. Right. I like yeah, that. Yeah, so that's neat. Yeah, it's a neat idea. Yeah. Xbox 360 uh, was very successful uh, last month in the U.S. Yeah, relatively speaking, you know, in the sense that uh, the video game market overall was down year over year. Uh, console sales were down 8.4%. But um, largely because of the success of the Kinect. Um, the Xbox 360 was the one console that grew year over year from a unit sales standpoint. And, um, you know, it just continued to do pretty well, you know, compared to the competition, so to speak. So um, supposedly even the the Move add-on, which is the kind of Kinect for PlayStation 3, is also doing pretty well. Um, although those guys were really, down. I'm surprised because I didn't like that thing at all. I think. Yeah, I, I've never. I mean, I've I've kind of played with it, you know, at yeah. Best Buy. <laughs> Basically, I mean, I, I it looks like a it looks like a sex toy. I mean, I just don't. I find it to be. 
You know, I did. I did notice that that uh, that rubber tip is soft. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and very very soft and pliable. It just felt good. See. And, Interesting. I never thought of it as, as that, though. I mean, good lord. No, I'm sorry, I brought you're, it up. You're pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Amazon has now announced that they're going to do streaming movies for their Prime members free. I'm a Prime member. That's an, I am too. And uh, what an interesting way to do this, right? So Amazon has this system called Amazon Prime where for $80 a year, uh, everything you order from the company by default goes through second day shipping and it's free. Uh, you know, you obviously pay the $80 a year, but you get second day shipping. And I, I, I order from Amazon all the time. So this works out for me. Absolutely. But now as a benefit of Amazon Prime, you also get a, a Netflix-style streaming video service. And it's not as, you know, as big as the Netflix service yet, certainly. But Amazon has had an, an on-demand video store for a long, long time, actually years and years. And uh, they've always done a pretty decent job with it. It's never really gotten a lot of traction compared to, say, you know, iTunes. But then, of course, nothing else has either. But now with this new service... Um, they're basically going after Netflix. They're going right after Netflix, baby. Yeah. Now it's only five thousand movies. It's not the same selection. <clears throat> no, no, no. It's it's it, you know again. It's it's sort of where Netflix was a few years ago. I'd say. I think it's just a, a kind of a side deal. You know, it's obviously not a big. It's not the reason to get Amazon Prime, but if you have it, it's this is a great side benefit. And it, and it, and and I think I kind of understand the strategy a little better because I started searching for movies and they intermix the free streaming movies with paid rentals and paid yes. purchases. So my thinking is it yep. Amazon maybe doesn't really need to go into competition or want to go into competition with Netflix. For them, it's a cheap way to get prime members to buy and rent more movies. It's kind of a it's kind of a loss leader. Come on if it, if you Yes, will. and it's uh, Again, it's a little hard to explain, but their their existing video service before they had this has, uh, competed with iTunes, right? Or uh, you know the um, the movie st you know movie rentals and right. the Apple TV type stuff. Right. Amazon had its has, still has that system. Right? Yeah. So w with this new service, what you basically get is a combination of say the Apple TV with Netflix. Although of course Apple TV has Netflix, but the cheapest Netflix service is the seven ninety nine a month. Uh, streaming only version of the subscription that's actually more expensive than amazon prime for a year right right if you do the yeah, math amazon's what 79 bucks for sam amazon prime a year right right so and netflix, netflix is, the cheapest, cheapest is, is, netflix is about 20 bucks a year uh, 20 bucks more a year right than just more amazon than prime yeah. plus you get the free ship you know free second day shipping which by the way is awesome if you don't have that it's right. awesome to have and you can also do something where you uh you can have something shipped in one day for three ninety nine, no matter what it is, which is crazy. It's another excellent. So I buy use that all the time. Oh. I do too. Yeah, it's great. Amazon's brilliant. Look, they get yeah. us to pay eighty bucks <laughs> for the privilege to buy more stuff from them. Yeah, I'm now, sure they the, make money the on problem, that. Problem. The, the, the well, there are many problems. I, Amazon says that this thing is available on all kinds of different devices, and I'm sure it is. But you know, Netflix is so ubiquitous. Um. You know that there is there are so many TVs and Blu-ray players and set-top boxes and video game consoles. I mean, it's just everywhere. And it's uh, right now, I would say it's a better experience. Um, you know, for me personally, because I have a son who is deaf and needs captioning, Netflix is the only streaming service. Yeah. Uh, well, Hulu has this, although Hulu isn't in this exact category. The only streaming service like this for movies and TV shows that has any kind of captioning at all. And they're actually dramatically expanding that this year. And, in fact, they just had an announcement about this. And I think that about 30% of their streaming videos now support captioning. The issue is some of the devices don't. So if you have a Roku box, they don't support it. But they will starting this summer. Uh, the Xbox 360, unfortunately, also does not support it currently. But the PS3 does, the Wii does, PCs and Macs do. Uh, what am I missing? I think there are some other devices that do as well. Um, so if, if if captioning is an issue for you, Netflix is uh, definitely something you should look at. And this is something you just don't typically see, you know, for whatever reason. Even, you know, if you look for movies on iTunes that have uh, captioning, it's it's a small percentage. They're there. They're hard to find, you know, unless you look through through the PC software, the Mac software. You know, if you're just sitting in front of an Apple TV trying to find a movie that has captioning, it's impossible. Um, you really have to be sitting in front of a computer. That's true of Netflix, too, but... 
it's getting better. So there are some services that have this stuff. Hey, hot news just came in. Yes. According to Win Rumors, <laughs> is Win Rumors uh, trustworthy? Maybe. <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Win Rumors <laughs> is uh, so. Win Rumors is uh, my friend, actually, Tom. Or oh, I actually, well, if I had known I, that, maybe I was trying to be funny. I, Tom is Tom, trustworthy. Okay. Guess what Tom says? Is this a Windows Eight thing? No. Okay, good. It's m even better, even more okay. exciting. Yep. Even more thrilling. Tom Warren <laughs> writing Windows yep. WinRumors dot com. April 6th, Angry Birds for Windows Phone 7. Oh, okay. So the date, that's, that's news, the date. Uh, I, I'm positive we talked about this. When, before Windows Phone came out, there was an Angry Bird graphic. Yes. And, a, uh, and, they, and Rovio, the makers of Angry Birds, said no. Right. Except that it was, it was always going to happen. I mean, so... Yeah, I guess it's uh, on every other freaking platform. So, <laughs> right, Angry Birds. It's on Mac. Was it's always Windows, coming to Windows everything. Phone. Yeah. It was always coming to Windows Phone. And what I was told basically at the time was they talked to the guys. They were pit, you know, they were mad because they scooped. Uh, you know, because they hadn't formally announced scooped it, and them. it was it caused a little bit of a stinking between the two companies. Yeah. But the truth is, this was always happening. Of this was this is was. not like a new development. I mean, they were always working on this. So. By the way, not just Angry Birds, but yes, Doodle Jump, yeah, Plants versus Zombies, yep, 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 yep. Hydro Thunder Go, that is Sonic the Hedgehog Four Episode One, and Geo Defense. So, at least three of those are obviously huge iOS games. Yes, and you have just described my Windows Phone pick of the week for the first three weeks of August. Okay, well, let's save it. <laughs> of, save oh, it. Oh, sorry, Hold April. It. Okay. Hold it. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, August. Okay. April. 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 Okay. August, I'd say. Uh, well, you, you don't have to hold it that long. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. I... <laughs> hold it till April. Okay, I can live with that. Actually, do hold your uh, Windows Phone app mm -hmm. of the week. Okay. Of which you can't remember the name. So no, maybe... I, I remembered it. Oh, good. <laughs> or I looked it up. I didn't remember it. <laughs> Our software pick of the week. And more as we continue. Paul Therat is tired, but he's also rested. It's a very confusing situation. And he's back. I'm, from I'm, I can beat. assure you when this is over, I'm going to stumble out of this room and I will pass out of my couch. Good. Well, we'll get this over with quickly. No, it's okay. It's, it's no Did rush. You see, I'm sorry, but okay. I didn't see yeah. the Super Bowl because, thank goodness. Well, <laughs> I saw it, but I saw the South American feed, the Latin American feed. It was kind oh, of funny was, because instead of any of the ads... All they had was soccer promos. <laughs> so, because okay. it's Latin America. And they, so, but anyway, I hear that one of the other domain registrar companies, which mm -hmm. has always done those kind of sleazy ads, and then they say, you want to see the rest, go to the I'm website. I'm familiar with this company. Uh, apparently put Joan Rivers in hot pants. Yes, they did. I didn't see it. Is it something I'm glad I didn't see? Yes, it is. My eyes are burning just thinking about it. Well, it was. Uh, there were many horrifying things in the Super Bowl ads this year, and I, let me think back here. That I'm trying to remember if that was the absolute worst. I think one. that must be the most horrifying. Was anyway, I don't like those guys, as you probably uh, could tell from the tone of voice. I don't <laughs> think you should use Joan Rivers' butt to sell domain registration. I'm sorry, I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy that way. I, I'm with you. <laughs> I think you should use service, quality, support. That's why I use Hover.com. I transferred my domains from those other guys. Actually, I still have a few that are locked. Gosh darn it. But I'm getting them all over. I wish I'd used Hover's uh, uh, domain transfer service. They have a service that makes it a lot easier. Here's what you do. Go to Windows, W-I-N. Do I have to spell this? W-I-N-D-O-W-S dot. I do have to spell this. Hover, H-O-V-E-R. Is there a dot in there? Dot com. Windows dot hover dot com. Yeah, you can't really <laughs> see it, but there's a dot in there. And when you go there, um, you will take a look at uh, their very clean, simple site. Not a lot of upsells and all that. And their new pain-reducing transfer process, just $10 for a limited time. They will transfer all your domains over. I wish I had done this. Oh, is this, is this automatic? Yeah, they do all the work. In other words, basically. they do this for you? Yeah. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you pay for myself. it, but it's worth it because if you have more than one domain, it's such a pain. And these other, yeah, yeah. and the other, uh, frankly, the registrars, you know, make it as hard as possible. Uh, and then you'll pay ten dollars for the new domain name, but that adds a year, so it's a ten dollar additional year on your domain registration. Right. Uh, I love Hover. Hover is so easy to use, so clean, so simple, and they do not try to upsell you. In fact, one of the things that I always buy, but it takes 80 clicks to get out of these other guys' site to buy it, is uh, who is privacy. You know, so people can't look up your home address and phone number on the right. who is registrar. That's free. That comes with Hover. Ooh. That comes with it. They know you want privacy. Hover is a division of two cows. They're an ICANN accredited, publicly traded technology company. You know them. You might know the name Domains Direct. That's their old name, but I like the new one. Hover. Like a hummingbird. Hovering to make you happy. Go to windows.hover.com and try it right now. You're, I, you know, I just think Hover is the best darn thing since sliced bread. And you get 10% off your new domain if you use that special code, that special site, windows.hover.com and the offer code windows. Domain names made simple. By the way, if you get, you know, if you need support, if you, you know, you're having trouble with the, the transfer or something like that, and you call somebody, they will not put you on hold. They guarantee it. During regular business hours, you do not get put on hold. Ever. Hover. Try it. Okay. Time for Ooh. our Windows Phone app of the week, a game which you, uh, which you now remember the name of. <laughs> okay, look it up. What is it? Uh, it's called iBlast Moki. Oh, I know the Monkeys. I and love is this. This is an iOS game. Oh, it is. Okay. So it, it, it's sort of Angry Birds-esque. Yeah, you know, it's you physics set, game. You yeah. set little bombs. and I love it. Uh, it took me a while to understand. It, I, I don't know if I missed the part of the instructions they, they went through it, but, you know, the first couple of screens are very simple because you, you put a bomb in a certain location and it causes the little guy to jump and right. hit the target and you think you did it. But then uh, subsequent screens, screens have two bombs. And harder. And you think, well, okay. Uh, progression it's simple enough but there's also a timer involved yeah so on the second bomb you could you know in other words you trigger the bomb to cause them to move a part of the way but then you don't want the bombs to go off at the same time so the second bomb you have a, a timer involved and you you know you want to get them through the target anyway i i found this to be very it's addictive really and, and yeah. yeah and for whatever it's worth you know when we were talking about the types of games that make sense on these touch screens this is a really oh, yeah. good example of that kind of thing and I like yeah, it. So that the the, the Moki right looks now. just like a piece of silly putty. Yeah. So you're doing this. On, what is this you're using? Is this an iPod? This is an iPhone. Uh, iPhone but it's, yeah. yeah. I think it's almost yeah, identical. Same game. Yep. Yeah. No, it's identical. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to get the Moki to where you want it to be by putting the bomb where you want it to be, and and using and the clock trajectories dials. you can use to determine the, the the direction of the blast. Like if you um, right. And there's a timer uh, as well. Timer. Yeah, so multiple, yeah. See, here's the trajectory. Here's the vector. Yeah, there's all kinds of obstacles, and you can scroll the screen around. And you know, it's it's nice. Okay. So I'm not I'm not interested in a game that is a complete ripoff of Angry Birds. I think Angry Birds is a great great game, but uh, this is not. This is <laughs> yeah. Ah. It, it, don't you feel like you should be able to tilt the phone to make it roll? That <laughs> yeah. actually does not work. Close, so close. Maybe maybe maybe. Oh man. Oh well, it's fun. It's it is actually very much like Angry Birds or Cut the Rope or there's a lot of these great physics games. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of these scary. There's cut games like uh, Fruit Ninja and yeah. You know, that's another category of game which you know my kids love that stuff. Whatever, but yeah. Um, yeah, the one on the iPhone my kids loved or the iPod was uh, Labyrinth Two. Oh, fun! You can apparently go to a website and design, um, you know, boards or whatever. I get they spent some amount of time on this. I was they were they were. They seem to enjoy that. Labyrinth 2. Now, let's see if I got the Moki this time. Oh, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Oh! oh so close. Little piece of silly putty. He just, he just, he won't cooperate. Anyway, that's, that. I agree with you. And I don't, is it free? I'm or intrigued it, that you knew about this. Oh, yeah. I play it a lot. I like it. I just grab every Xbox Live game that comes down the pike for the right. phone, so. By the way, Xbox Live achievements for Angry Birds. Of course, yeah, yeah Xbox course. Live game, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yep. Uh, software pick of the week, my friend. So, uh, yeah, we mentioned this earlier briefly, but Windows 7 Service Pack 1 is out. So I would just recommend everyone grabbing that and, uh, and up, upgrading. Uh, again, uh, from a functional standpoint, you're not really going to notice a lot, but that's not really the point. It's just an aggregation of 
uh, existing fixes and some new fixes. So it's it's sort of the baseline for Windows 7 going forward. So uh, definitely something if you haven't been prompted to download already, um, you can check Windows Update manually. It should be in there for you. So make that happen. Make it happen, baby. And uh, that concludes this edition of Windows Weekly. I see you have an audible pick. We'll save that for another day. Yep, no problem. No problem. Paul Thorat back from Madrid. It's nice to have you back. We both went to nice uh, you back as well. Yeah, Spanish language countries. <laughs> now we did this show at a little bit of a different time because Paul was still yeah. in Spain yesterday. But we'll be back on our regular Thursday schedule, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv every Thursday. If you want to watch live, but of course you can subscribe to the show, and I hope you will uh, at uh, on iTunes, on the Zoom Store, and everywhere else. Just I was halfway Windows across Weekly. the Atlantic yesterday, and every device in my bag started chiming simultaneously. And it was time the for the show. Reminder for the Windows Weekly. <laughs> time <laughs> for the show. Time yep. for the show. Somebody's asking in the chat room. As long as uh, I got you mm -hmm. here, what the best way to install the service pack? Would you? It's going to be just pretty straightforward. You don't need to. Do the, a honestly, clean the best install. way is to do it through Windows Update because okay. there's actually a prerequisite. Um, so if you if you're going to download ah. and install it manually, you're going to want to know about that. And I mentioned it in my article about this, but rather than overthink it, uh, really the best way is the Windows Update. And it's not just for that reason. Um, the Windows Update version will check what you already have, and right. it will just download a smaller bit. And you don't need to do a clean install or wipe or anything like that. No, 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 no. This 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 won't cause any compatibility issues or anything like that. So. I would just do it on Windows Update. Paul and Rod, get some get some rest. Did and did, <laughs> in fact, and did myself. Yeah. Get some rest, um, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tom Merritt, for filling in. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not going to South by Southwest, are you? No, I'm not. Oh, rats! Sorry, we're going to thought about it. It's such a this fun is, it's event. Mid, is it mid March? It's mid March. Yeah, March 13th and 14th. We're we're going to be there for the interactive uh, the Saturday yeah. and Sunday. There's we're, some stuff going on there. There's I I heard a rumor that IE9 might be released there, although I don't. No, Actually, really? It's South by? I don't think that's going to be the I case. But so. hey, who knows? They will be there. I know that the IE guys will be. Oh, there, it's but. so much fun! It's just a, it's just kind of a party. We're going to be live, yep. so you don't have to go. We're going to be live covering. I, I, I can't really justify it. No, but. just watch Twit. Yeah. Saturday, March twelfth, we'll be doing the party coverage from four o'clock on. Mm -hmm. Sunday, we're doing. Uh, we're going to have. We've got a venue. We've got Momo's Club. Yeah, in this Austin. is uh, Austin. Is a oh, I love it. It's a fun place. Oh, I love Austin. So uh, 1 o'clock, I'll be doing the radio show there. 4 o'clock, TNT. 5 o'clock, Twit. Uh, 7 o'clock, a meetup all at Momo's Club. Momosclub.com if you want to know more and find out about it. And, uh, boy, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a blast. So see you in Austin, March 13th. Paul Thorat, I'll see you next week. All right. Take care. Out of Windows Weekly.